we are live now. Let's give it a start. Is, uh, as the title said, we're going to talk about maxi sinus grafting. Is, um, and what you just saw on that previous slide is, uh, yeah, I was a professor in the oral surgery department at University of Miami um, for 18 years, actually. And, um, and now what you saw in that lower right-hand corner of that picture uh, is one of my offices, not in private practice. And I have six different offices, and that's sort of the headquarters office there. Um, from when we're doing maxi sinus grafting is, um, you know, oftentimes what happens is, is bones resorbed by the sinus pneumatizing and becoming larger. Is bones generally resorb from the crest when the teeth are extracted because the body has sort of a use it or lose it um, attitude. So his bone starts getting dissolved. But what happens is from the sinus, it's dissolved from the crest and from the, the sinus. So from both sides. And, um, and that's why typically is that's the area that needs mo most bone augmentation because there's just so much that needs to be, uh, so much that's been lost from both sides. And so our goals are, as you can see, a creep bone in the posture uh, maxilla is to accommodate for the bone that's been lost. But that bone has to be as good or better than the bone that was lost. And because it was poorer than the bone that was lost, and you're already talking about an area that has poor bone to begin with, and you grow even poorer you know, bone, then it only does part of the part solution, of the not all the solution. solution. So it needs to be as good or better, and that's what we're going to talk about going to better bone, is by using the appropriate graft materials, is uh, by using appropriate uh, packing techniques about uh, is uh, treating the membrane, the sinus membrane appropriately. And then, then long term, that bone has to be the patient's own bone so it can maintain a occlusal load for implants, not just a bunch of synthetic left up in there that won't then support an implant, but just looks good. And so, and then it's got to be with high predictability, 98, 99, 99.5% success rates. And in everyone's hands, not just in my hands, is, uh, but in everyone's hands, and this reproducible. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about. Is there's other options for the posterior maxilla, of course. As the top line, we're going to talk about the lateral window approach. Is but you can see just below that is a crestal approach. Um, I put osteotome or, or crestal. Um, is if you just watched uh, Facebook Live that was just by Pavel on uh, using his uh, specialized osteotomes, you can see that type of approach. Um, or you could avoid the maxi sinus altogether by placing implants anterior to it is uh, what was originally described as the all on four procedure and has been modified over the years. And in our modifications, we actually call it the full arch implant rehabilitation, the FAIR procedure. And, um, and we've made the modifications and made it very, very predictable and something that's reproducible and uh, have actually published a textbook that just came out a few months ago from Quintessence Publishing. And literally that's the title of it, full arch implant rehabilitation FAIR is, um, and so that would be something to avoid the sinuses. Um, avoiding by putting implants posterior to the sinus in the zygoma. And, uh, and that's something that's done is less frequently. It requires uh, much more clinical skills. It requires um, is, is bigger flaps. It requires, um, usually it's for patients that have no bone up in the maxilla at all. It's sort of the last is a resort. Is we're working on a textbook on that. We certainly have courses on that. And the textbook on that is, uh, should be out within about six months or so. And um, I, we haven't talked to the publishing house yet, so I don't know who the publishing house is for that's gonna be. And then the fourth option would be short implants. Just using whatever available bone is there is to place the implants. Um, that wouldn't work if the ridge is one millimeter, but maybe for six millimeters, seven millimeters, maybe trying to get it with just short implants there. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna graph the sinus, we have to understand the sinus anatomy. And um, fundamentally in this, short 40 minute presentation, we'll just touch on this little aspect, but there's obviously much more involved to it than this. There's the, the maxi sinus, the, the frontal sinus, the ethmoidal sinus, a number of different sinuses. And, um, and the cells that are replaced in those sinus membranes is they're all shed and drain through a common port name known as the osteum or osteomedial complex or infundibulum. Those are all the synonyms for each other. And, um, is, and that drains into the nose. And so um, we've got to keep that opening patent. And so we've got to be sure in our maxi sinus grafting that we don't put so much bone in there or push something up in there or bone particles are so large that they may occlude that uh, opening. So we got to be aware of uh, having is appropriate size bone particles small enough so that if they did go through a sinus tear, 
uh, they wouldn't uh, plug up that osteum and, uh, and then minimize them going through a sinus membrane tear by minimizing tears is, um, is there and not elevate the sinus is uh, to plug it up. And you can look here, CT scan is uh, shown in three different slices. Is, um, and if you look at this uh, a slice in the posterior maxilla, right? And that's shown is right here on your upper left. Is, um, so <clears throat> on that upper left there is what you see is that the black, that's the bone. The blue portion is what was the soft tissue component of that bone is uh, collagen, et cetera. And that's all is gone. And you see on the right hand side, is slice number three, you see in the maxillary sinus is air, and you see the ridge, and you see the center of the ridge, the cancellous bone. And uh, that cancellous bone is almost looks like air in terms of relative density. And uh, so you can see why I wouldn't want more of the same quality bone because relatively poor bone is when I grow bone there, I'd like better bone growing in there. I'm gonna give them preoperative antibiotics and the preoperative antibiotics, um, I'd like about 2,000 milligrams of amoxicillin, but um, I like to have what's called augmentin. It's amoxicillin and clavulonic acid because about 5% of bacteria are resistant to the amoxicillin. And so um, the way I do the dosing is I take is one 875 milligram tablet of augmentin. So I will have the amoxicillin and clavulonic acid, and then two 500 milligrams of amoxicillin an hour before the surgery. So give me 1,875 milligrams of amoxicillin, almost uh, is 2,000 milligrams. And if you're allergic, you can see that right below that. I give them two grams of Keflex instead. And then I make my incision. I would like to go slightly palatal to the midline, whatever possible, is if it's a fat ridge. If it's a thin knife edge ridge, and it might be tough to dissect over that knife edge, then I make it a mid-crestal incision. And on occasion, if there's, for example, a bridge there and the dentist is unwilling to remove that bridge until after I've done the sinus lift and, uh, and place the implants, then I will make a vestibular incision. And you can see that listed here and you can see the little dotted line on the left-hand picture is uh, showing that. <clears throat> and this is showing the uh, a, a dry skull maxilla on the left-hand side. The right-hand side, you see that's Hiltatum. And uh, he was a guy that discovered and first... Uh, talked about and first published on is I'm actually sinus lift, both the lateral wall approach and the crystal approach. And um, you see on the left-hand side, the infraorbital foramen is high up. So when we're doing a sinus lift there, we're not impinging on that or any other vital structures there. And the way Hilt Tatum had described it was a rectangle, as you see in the lower drawings there, a rectangle with a dot, dot, dot across the top. And, um, is, and then he said, you fracture that window in and left it the, the top portion act as a hinge and, um, and elevate the sinus membrane for you. And it was a clever idea, but when clinically doing it, I started doing a lot of these in my residency program and is after I joined the faculty after my residency program, is um, the dot, dot, dots at the top would oftentimes is tear the sinus membrane. And, uh, and oftentimes the corners there would tear the sinus membrane is the sharp edges. And so um, it led to a lot of torn membranes. And then the third thing is he recommended 701 Fisher burr. And I found that that burr would oftentimes is, um, <clears throat> is tear membranes. So we published a modified approach paper. And in our modified approach is what we did is we used to round burr as you can see here. And, um, and then we start in the ANBs and we switched over to piezo as we get closer to sinus membrane, which is even milder, less chance of perforating. And then we limited the round corners, uh, excuse me, the, the, the sharp corners and made them rounder at the, at the bottom. And we limited the dot, dot, dot by making it contiguous. So these four modifications, making the corners rounded, making this portion rounded and contiguous, using a round diamond and uh, using a piezo unit was our um, modified approach. And I think that's pretty much universal now. I think that has gone worldwide, our modified approach there is uh, shown here on the left of that drawing. And on the right-hand side, you can see I've made the window. You can see when I've gone from bone to sinus membrane because you see the color change. And um, you can see the color now is sort of non-bone color, is uh, from bone color. And, uh, and that's how I'm getting through. And then I can elevate that island of bone off as the Hiltatum is shown. And I will show you a case where I do that. It's, um, most often, if I can easily take it off, I take it off because it gives me better access and better visibility 
right? If I can't get it off easily, I will leave it on. But if I can easily get it off, it just makes the rest of the procedure go much smoother for me. And I need one keratin for the posterior, one for the superior, one for the anterior, one for the inferior. So um, that would be two double-ended keratins would have the four configurations that I need. And what you see here is four double-ended keratins. And the reason for that is the top two give me the four dimensions that I need. The next two is they're the same keratin, but larger in size. Just like you were taught in dental school that you should use a large diamond burr you know, when excavating decay, so less chance it falls into the pulp. Is similarly, a large curet means less chance it's gonna fall, okay, or tear the sinus. And so that's why you see four of those there. And then you just, you just see a condenser there to pack the bone in because I need to pack it in everywhere. So I've got bone everywhere and I don't have voids. And also, so the bone gets maximally dense because if the bone is maximally dense, then my graft will be maximally dense. If the bone is loose and fluffy, then my eventual bone, as that grows, it will be loose and fluffy. So the density will be dependent on is, um, is that, no, okay? Um, and now I'll, do, I'll go on the curette, and I will um, go in circumferentially two or three millimeters, no, okay? So two or three millimeters circumferentially, and just elevate the membrane a bit, no, okay? As, um, and once I've done that, two or three millimeters, is, then we'll begin reflecting it off the floor. And you can see on the left-hand side, and you'll see the drawing of that on the right-hand side, elevating off the floor. All right? So elevating off the floor of them. And then we inject in graft material. Right? I place the graft material. And then I can take either an island of bone and put it here to cover the a window or a membrane um, or a PRP membrane. My personal favorite is PRP membranes, but I will show you cases even in the short presentation of using the bone itself and of using a membrane. All right? And then once the, uh, the bone is matured, we can place the implant. We can also talk about could we do it simultaneously is at the same time, we'll talk about that also. All right. Here, this is about a 35 minute procedure and uh, we've trimmed it down to about uh, three and a half minutes. So just edited down in the interest of time is, uh, and just showing you little snippets of scrubbing in, a little snippet of uh, gowning up, a little snippet of um, elevating the flap, a little snippet of making the window is a little piece of elevating the membrane, a piece of packing the bone, a piece of suturing. So you'll see all the portion of surgery. It just won't, um, is, won't be in real time. And then later on, I'll show you another surgery that's more in real time. So here's our incision, vertical release in the anterior, 15 millimeters long. And then we'll start making it a round or oval window. All right. And then once I've gone through it, in this case, I'm leaving the island of bone on. Then we'll go on the curette about two to three millimeters all the way around circumferentially. And now you can see I'm elevating off the sinus floor. Oh, okay. And you see I've gotten to the medial wall of the maxilla. And you can see that's a large curettes now. Okay, I've taken tissue bank bone, and that's what we find is the best for maxillary sinus lifts. I've hydrated it with PRP. I've taken liquid PRP and hydrated it. That's concentrated platelets, concentrated fibrin, concentrated leukocytes. I've taken a PRP gel, that was not the liquid version, but gel, dried it between some gauze, and I made a PRP membrane. And now uh, this is the bone hydrated with the PRP. Okay, and I just inject a syringe full in there. Okay, and then I inject in subsequent syringe fulls and then pack it in there nicely and put our PRP membrane across there and then suture it up.
Now here, I didn't place the implant simultaneously, but I've gotten that question frequently that um, what happens in regards to placing implants you know, simultaneously is we did a bone symposium that we hosted in West Palm Beach a number of years ago. And at that time, no one had guidelines for uh, when you could do immediate placement of implants. And so someone asked the panel a question, when can we place implants simultaneous to the bone graft and when they have to be is delayed? And, um, you know, I just kind of made up the answer on the fly. I said, well, at that time, this is two decades ago, is all the implants were being placed were about 15 millimeters. And uh, we weren't placing eights and tens to any large extent. And so we said, well, a third the length of the implant meaning five millimeters. And, uh, and that was a mastermind group meeting. So the folks in the audience were key opinion leaders themselves. They were um, chairmen of oral surgery departments and chairmen of period departments and um, heads of implant associations and, uh, and speakers and authors and such. So they all copied that idea down and they started propagating that idea that you need five millimeters across the bone in order to place implants simultaneously. And we had never researched that. We just kind of said that. That was just, you know, just trying to quickly answer a question. And, and then we came back and said, you know, is since we said that, is what we should be doing is um, researching that, you know? And so what we did, we, we got a number of patients and we started doing research on that, you know, okay? And we got the patients and um, as you can see in this article published in the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Implants, which at that time and, e and even today is considered the top tier of, uh, of implant journals um, and so put out by quintessence publishing is we took patients with three to five millimeter ridges and so 160 implants and 63 sinuses and um, is two and a half year follow-up you see 31 month follow-up and no failures 100 percent success at two and a half years in three to five millimeter ridges and we published as you can see in 1999 21 years ago now and um, is as, and then we did another follow-up article as it came out actually a year earlier because the journal was able to get it out earlier is um, sinus floor augmentation with simultaneous implant placement in this severely atrophic maxilla. And um, this is one to two millimeter ridges. And you can see even a one to two millimeter ridges is um, no failures at uh, two year follow-up, 55 implants, a little bit smaller study. Is this is eggshell maxilla. I mean, nothing stabilizing the implant other than just me mechanically condensing the bone inside the maxillary sinus. And, um, and, and you say, well, what about even longer term than that? And so this is a nine year follow up study. And this is much, much larger 2,132 implants, 731 human sinuses. And in the top tier peer reviewed journal, International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Implants by Quintessence Publishing and by Michael Pellig, who's on our faculty and myself. And, um, and he published this in 2006, so 14 years ago now. And um, is thousands of implants, is almost a thousand lateral sinus lifts, is uh, one to five millimeter ridges, placing implants simultaneously. And if you look over the results section, the cumulative survival rate at nine years was 97.9% success rate. You know, with this procedure and the techniques we're talking about, is published data in top tier journals showing a 98% success rate at nine years with thousands of implants and nearly a thousand lateral sinus lifts. And you see in the conclusion section um, with, a, with a, at least one to two millimeters of vertical bone, but that's it, okay, is uh, one to five millimeters of bone. Mm -hmm. So these things will work. However, in spite of what I recommend is for those starting out to do it in a stage fashion, do the sinus graph, design the bone, come back and place the implants, okay? But those with experience can certainly do it simultaneously with high success rates. So if we go through this clinical case, this scenario is uh, we're gonna make our incision, okay? Mid crest draw slightly palatal, vertical release in the anterior maxilla, about 15 millimeters, okay? Reflect the flap, all right? Once we reflect the flap, we're gonna use a round diamond to make a window. We're gonna make it oval instead of rectangular, no sharp edges. Okay, no green stick fracture of the superior aspect. Is if we want to, if we have it available, we'll get a piezo unit with a diamond tip as shown in this picture on the, your right hand side and go with a piezo unit, much less chance of tears with the piezo unit. All right, and then we'll is lift off the island of bone. All right, you could push it in. In this case, I 
didn't have that option, you'll see why in a minute. On the right-hand side picture, you see that small septum that's there? And here you can get a better view of it. Okay, I'll show you in the subsequent one. Okay. Now, the pieces have been around for almost two decades. In you know, 2004, they're available in Europe. They weren't available in the U.S. yet. So when I was in Europe, I purchased one. I brought it back to the U.S. in 2004. They're 16 years ago now. And at that time, his folks really didn't know a lot about piezo surgery units. And my uh, colleague, Mario Steigman from Germany and I, we published this article in 2006 in Implant Dentistry Journal on the basics and the possibilities of piezo surgery. Is, uh, and at that time, we had two years experience and that we need to talk about the basics, fundamentals, because folks didn't understand it. And we need to talk about is the possibilities because again, folks didn't is know it and we didn't know all the different possibilities. And, and now in 2020, 16 years after we started using it, 14 years after we published it all on basics and possibilities, is now there's hundreds of things. Back then there was one or two tips that were available. Now there's a hundred different tips that can be used for different applications. And it's, and it's everywhere. Most folks have piezo surgery units. And, uh, and you saw the diamond tip I used in the surgery to make the window. You see this tip on the left-hand side here. It's more like a trumpet and flare. We'll use that at a much lower power setting and put that trumpet in and go around. And that will gently elevate that sinus membrane two or three millimeters all the way around is what that does. All right. And once I've done that, then I use my sinus curates to elevate the sinus membrane. And you can see in the upper right-hand side why here I didn't even have the choice of pushing that window in because you can see the septum that's there. It would have been impossible to push that uh, bony window in. And so we elevated it all. And then, as you saw in my previous, the, the live surgery video is injecting in the bone. You see in this case, in slides, injecting in the bone. And uh, I just kind of treat the two chambers separately. I first do the anterior chamber, and then I pack in the bone so there's no voids anywhere and maximize the density. And then I do the posterior chamber. You know, and then again, pack in the bone. And then once I've done anterior and posterior chamber, I do right over the septum. And so once I've packed that bone down, you see in the upper right-hand side, I put the bone membrane, the patient's own bone as a membrane. Okay, and then I can use another commercial membrane or PRP membrane if you'd like to. And so in this case, I did. All right. Put another membrane and then sutured it up. All right. All right. Here's another case. This is a very, very old case. And you'll recognize the implants. They're old Branamark implants. And you'll see um, is that here's the pre-op. Right. You can see on the left-hand side, the panorex. And on the right-hand side, you see the width post-op graft, all right? And this is uh, over 20 years ago. At that time, we were doing sinus lifts with anorexics. Now, of course, I have CT scans available. I do with CT scans, all right? And so after the sinus graft, I went in, I is, uh, placed three implants. You see the paralene pins on the right-hand side. And then I took an impression at the time of surgery. You see that on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is immediate post-implant placement. You see back then all the implants we placed with 15 millimeters long. And uh, you can is, uh, tell these are the external hex brain and mark implants at that time. And then the, the laboratory custom design is uh, through the computer, CAD CAM milling and, and fabricating abutments. And you see the images that were designed on the computer on the left-hand side. And they sent those computer milled abutments and temps for us. So at stage two surgery, instead of round healing cuffs, we had custom emergence profile healing cuffs. All right. And you see a lot of talk these days about customized uh, is, uh, healing cuffs to, to make that is emergent profile correct. And that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. right. Here's another case. Okay. So we did one live surgery video, uh, two with slides. Okay. This is the fourth case I'll show you in this presentation. This will be a live video in this case. Okay. And this one's a bit longer. So here I didn't edit it out. Um, the previous one we edited out, things in the interest of time. Here, we're gonna show all of it so you can see is how much time does it take for the incision, how much time to reflect the flap, how much time to make a window, how much time to elevate the sense membrane, how much time to uh, inject the bone, et cetera.
I'm just outlining for my residents and students is, um, is where the window's gonna be. I'm measuring because I took some preoperative measurements on the Panorex is how much bone I need and what size implants I need. And I'm just measuring to confirm that the window is gonna be in the area I need. And in a couple of areas, you can see I've gone through the, the lateral wall of the sinus. So you can see how paper thin in some areas that sinus wall is. And I've already gone through in a couple of areas. And uh, in those areas have already gone through, okay? Is, but that serves as sort of a depth control for me because then I know, okay, is, um, is what the depth needs to be, okay? is I see a question here in the chat, can you mix the bone with blood instead of PRP? Of course you can. Okay, sometimes hard to get enough blood, but if you can get enough, of course you can. Um, I see, can we place gummy bone for the graft and sinus? Absolutely, and that would actually be better to make it a gummy bone consistency so it doesn't migrate, even if there was a tear in the sinus membrane. Is I didn't show that here in any of these cases because in case folks uh, weren't aware what gummy bone was and uh, how to fabricate it, but for those that are aware and are fabricating, absolutely, that would actually be preferred, okay? I see it from Dr. Grit. What's your opinion about grafting with xenografts? Um, well, my opinion isn't very favorable, but my opinion isn't based on opinion, is based on numerous articles out there. The amount of bone that's grown when you put a tightest bone in, is it becomes like host bone, is 60%. The tissue bank, it's about 50%. With the xenografts, it's about 18%. So much, much lower amounts of uh, bone are formed when xenografts are done. And the residual particles stay there for years and years. So when you screw the implant in, it's not against patient's own native bone, it is screwed against xenograft, which is still there. And so, so you told me one tip last time, use epinephrine or lidocaine for elevating the sinus membrane. Um, yeah, is I didn't show that here, but what I do oftentimes, I take gauze and I soak it with the lidocaine with epinephrine and then pack that in the sinus to help stop any oozing and bleeding. The epinephrine benefit does that. Um, I said, do you determine thickness of sinus wall in the CT scan? It is absolutely, okay? Is um, I always look at, uh, since I have CT scans available today, I always look at that. So I have a sense of how much drilling I'm gonna need to do. And if it's a thin maxillary sinus, I may just start with a piezo. I may not go the round diamond. If it's medium, then I'll start with a round diamond and then switch to the piezo. And if it's really, really thick, I may actually start with a round carbide and then go to the round diamond. So it matters in terms of what approach to use and it matters so I can get my orientation of how quickly, how aggressively, how slowly, how carefully I should go. So absolutely look at the, the thickness on that. Okay. I see here, is it live on the group? And uh, it sounded like, Kate, it wasn't live on the group, but if you can try again, that would be nice for the folks that are in the group and that did not get in the Zoom. Um, just to put it in there. Uh, what I mean by the group is the Facebook group that was uh, kind of planning this. Or... Okay. Hi. Right. Um, I don't see other questions popping up. So if there aren't questions, I'll just go back to narrating the video, um, what you see here is now we're almost through. You see the color change? I'm just checking with that tip to see if it moves. If the island moves, I know I'm through. Okay, now it's moving. See the distal part moving? But the mesial part didn't move, so I'll go a little bit more on the mesial. They can see which part is moving, which part isn't, to know where I'm through and where I'm not. Okay, now you see movement all the way around of the island. Just maybe a little bit up there didn't move quite as much. Okay. Okay, all right. You see, I'm just doing just checking slowly, slowly, slowly where I have movement and uh, here's where I don't.
And then here you can see I'm elevating off the sinus uh, window there. Okay, just a curette underneath it. Okay, just like elevating the sinus membrane off the floor, I'm elevating the sinus membrane off that little bone island. Okay, and there's a sinus membrane. Okay, most of you have probably seen this by now. If not, then in doing the surgery, you've certainly seen it in videos and, and et cetera. Okay. I'll take that trumpet in there. Okay, that trumpet tip, and you see, I'll just go around. And in some of the areas where the bone is very thin, okay, that those little thin portions just sort of fracture off just from these vibrations. So it sort of enlarges the window for me as well. So enlarge the window for me, these very thin areas come off, and I'm just kind of flicking them off. And then I'm also elevating and is getting this trumpet in there, and it's getting a couple of millimeters of sinus membrane elevation all the way around. I think it's just got a delicate uh, in this motion there. Okay. There are some piezo tips that look like curettes, but you see how thick that tip is? No, okay. So I'm, I'm just showing it to you is that that's not is what I prefer. And I find they don't quite have the angles that I like. And so I love the piezo for the diamond burr. I love it for saw blade for other applications. I love it for the trumpet to elevate this. But you can see, I, I just showed you that. You can see how this, the curette angle, okay, is scraping on bone, not pushing on the sinus membrane. As um, you see, because it cuts in, so it is always scraping bone, not the sinus membrane. And so really, really minimize the chance of tears. And if there's more questions, just type them in that chat box and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, and now you can see we've kind of slowed down, right? I mean, you saw the, the first part because here I didn't do uh, the, the first live surgery I showed, we did heavy editing, so I just showed snippets of each step. But here, this is more in real time. And you can see I, you know, uh, elevated the flap quickly, uh, made the window relatively quickly, took off the island of bone quickly, but now I've slowed way down. I'm taking my time, going a little bit of time, a little bit of time, so much, much, much slower. And then when we're packing the bone, then we'll speed back up. Putting the membrane on, suturing will we'll speed back up. can see some of the uh, moisture that's there from either some that's the moisture either from uh, the piezo unit or a little oozing there and you can see my assistant's dabbing it with some gauze and trying to get it she may not be able to get it inside and that's when I would um, is pack that gauze inside and here I might do it dry but my preferred way is to soak it in lidocaine with epinephrine for the epinephrine benefit so that it, it constricts the blood vessels okay um, I said, how do we know the membrane is perforated? Is, um, well, let, let's take a couple of different ways. I mean, if it's huge, you know because you see it. It's huge. Is um, small ones, you might know because when they take a deep breath into their nose, and this show is take a deep breath into your nose, the membrane will go up, breathe back on, it goes back down. So if she's able to do that, okay, then that would indicate is uh, no perforations. Okay, so if you see a perf, well, you see a perf. If uh, if she's able to um, do that, then she. Now, because the sinus membrane folds so much on its own now that I'm elevating it, if there's a tiny pinpoint hole, okay, and it folds on itself, she would still be able to move it up. And so pinpoint holes, you may not be able to see like that just from that. And you may not see it because pinpoint, and you may not be able to um, tell from breathing in, but pinpoint holes may not matter. Okay, because just like it's folded up when she does it, it's folded up during the healing process. Okay, so either by the breathing in trick, okay, or by seeing it, if it's too small for either one of those, it may be a little pinhole in this area, but then it becomes insignificant. Okay, if you say, well, I'd like just to be extra careful. Can I just put a membrane up in there every single time? You could, but a four-month membrane is $100. 
And so it's you know sort of wasted money. And and further than that, they just an extra thing up in there. And um, you're not getting a lot of oxygen potential for the underside of the sinus membrane, but whatever little bit you are getting is you're blocking it. And so if I was going to put one up, there's insurance just routinely, I would use a PRP membrane that is not blocking anything, but rather providing growth factors. Okay. And plugging up any endpoint tears. So a PRP membrane up in the routinely would not be a bad idea. Okay. Um, I see the question, how do you manage any or bleeding in case when the injured is artery branches here at this time. Um, there aren't any artery branches we're working. There is an artery branch that's about 17 millimeters above the ridge crest. It's not an artery, it's an arteriole. And so um, you're not going to hit it at the, si at the site you're at. Right? But if you made the window too high, and you can see it's hard to make it too high. It's hard to make it too high just because you see the retractor. You see how my staff is struggling to retract for me? You say, make them retract up here and force yourself. It's very, very tough to have a misadventure and make it too high. But if you did make that small arteriole, um, then you take an electrocauter unit. Okay, you stop the bleeding. Okay, with electrocauter unit. Um, I see a question here. How do you identify and manage the distal maxillary arteries you draw the bony wall of the piezo? Uh, once again, that is a non-issue. It uh, it's much higher than you make the window. And so you're not going to be... Uh, is, is there, and um, is if somehow you manage, even, you know, got enough reflection, got enough retraction to get up in there, is with electro cautery to zap it. Um, you see one syringe full, okay, and this is what surprises most people, is a second syringe full, okay, and these are large one cc syringes. The sinus is 15 cc's in volume, and that's approximation. It depends on how much pneumatization has occurred but I'm gonna pack them at three cc's of bone. So we're not obliterating the sinus at all. No, okay. Was, um, but we are putting in three cc's of volume. Okay. Someone came in late, is Dr. Ruben, why you removed the bone, can't we fold it inside? You can, okay, that's a personal preference. Um, I do a lot of training programs where folks come and operate on my patients and they do ladder wall after ladder wall, they do 15, 20 ladder wall, sinuses on patients under my supervision, and I give them the choice. And if there's a patient that needs bilateral, I say one side, leave it on, one side, take it off. And I find about 95% when they're given the option, prefer to take it off. Okay, and there's 5% that still prefer to leave it on. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so we know the, if the membrane is unbroken, if the patient during inhaling lift the membrane and during exhale, put it down, yes. Okay, Dr. Lanza is uh, when they breathe in and out, if it goes up and down, that means no perforation or perhaps a pinhole perforation that folded on itself, but then it's clinically insignificant, so we don't need to put a patch on it. But again, if you want to be extra careful and put routine PRP membrane patches up in the sinus uh, membrane, you could, you know, okay? And it would serve a benefit, not just insurance, but to um, provide growth factors in there. The lenses, so we know the membranes, are, yeah. That we answered that. Again, I find for the novice is when they're starting out, they're just surprised about how much is a bone needs to be in there. And from my way of thinking, as long as I've got the guy open, I mean, why should I be chintzy and stingy on the bone? Let me give him the bone he needs. You know, I've got him open. I've done the surgery. It was, uh, you know, it's been an extra one minute and uh, an extra bit of money and give him the, the you know, volume that he needs. If you didn't remove that excess around the periphery, that would be fine. Uh, okay, the body would resorb it. it was, um, I'm a little OCD about things, so I'm removing all that excess there. I see a question from Dr. Hazari. Have you ever had to abort the process under what condition? Oh, sure, lots of times. Um, is before I told you I've been doing this for so many years, we didn't always have CT scans available. When I started, it was panorexis. And uh, sometimes you didn't see pathology in there. And you get in there, and you elevate the center's membrane, it falls down. Elevate the center's membrane, it falls down. And you find that there's a big old uh, cyst up in there, and um, or a big up polyp. 
And so while I'm there, I want to make the patient healthy. And so I would curate it out. And you know, when there's that, even though I'm curating it, I'm irrigating it well, if there's any bacteria left up in there, I don't want to take a chance on my graft. And so we would abort and come back and redo it. As, um, as if it's really a huge tear and you just can't get good containment of the graft material, then better to allow the body to reform that sinus membrane and then come back and, uh, and redo it. So with pathology, I would do it. And with large tears, I would do it. Is, um, I, I've heard this, this one guy um, that used to do chin blocks and never really did a lot of sinus lifts is Mike Picos. And he says um, he's never uh, aborted a case. Well, you know, if you've never done a case, you never aborted a case, <laughs> okay? But when you do thousands of them, I mean, we literally do uh, you know, thousands per year of these lateral wall sinus lifts. And, um, and this is what we're known for and publish books on this and, uh, and lots of articles on this. And so, um, of course, of course. Um, I see as a must to place the membrane before reposition the flap. It is, no, okay, it really is a must to place the membrane over the lateral window. Any contraindications for patients taking blood thinners? Yes, of course. Um, that's a surgical contraindication. It's not that that's a sinus lift or anything, but um, anyone taking blood thinners, you have to manage that in advance because um, as, uh, if you then you will otherwise you can't control the bleeding. Okay. Um, this is Oscar. Okay, another case, and we'll just go right through this. Is uh, and by now you get it. You know we presented four cases, uh, two live surgeries, two slides. This is the fifth case. On the left hand side, we've taken PRP gel. We'll push it down and compress it, and make a PRP membrane. And on the right hand side, you see our uh, tissue bank bone. I get the tissue bank bone from Osteolife Biomedical. And um, the website is osteolifebiomedical.com. I can actually, it is Kate, you can just type that in the comment section if you want, osteolifebiomedical.com so that um, people know the spelling. And then um, I'll take PRP liquid because I can make PRP into gel or liquid or membrane, different configurations and hydrate that bone. There's my window, you can see that. And um, it's kind of a medium thickness sinus. Is, uh, wall, it's not thin, not thick. That's what I consider medium thickness. And then here I'm sliding an island of bone off. And again, you could leave it on if you wanted to. I'm gonna go in a couple of millimeters all the way around, about two millimeters. And then once I've done that, then I'll start uh, is elevating off the sinus membrane. This slide is just out of sequence. This should have been obviously before I elevated. And then we'll take the trumpet, okay, go around circumferentially and elevate that sinus membrane is um, as I showed, because I had that slide out of order. There's the sinus membranes, okay? There we're hydrating the bone with the PRP liquid. And then we'll take that, the sinus membrane is elevated, and then we'll um, just pack that bone in the sinus. All right, syringe full after syringe and then put some type of membrane over the lateral window, okay? Uh, and then suture it up. Here's another case. This is a small one tooth case, okay? Small flap, small sinus window. Okay, taking the bone. Here you can see I'm picking up the bone with some tweezers. This is the gummy bone configuration. For those of you who are trained and know how to make the PRP in the gummy bone configuration, I can pack it with holes in there. So even if I had a small tear, it wouldn't go anywhere. And then I place the implant. You can see it on the left-hand slide. And I had a pre-made customized healing abutment. So I'm make, putting a pre-made customized healing abutment there. And we'll finish up with a sixth and final case is, uh, is what we'll do. And for the sixth and final case is we're using this kit and you can see I've made my flap and exposure. On the kit, you see the diamond burr has a drill stop on it. And so only the portion of the diamond sticking beyond that blue drill stop can cut. And I put a 0.5 millimeter drill stop on there first and I go down 0.5 millimeters. And if that allows me to be at the sinus membrane, I'm done. And I start using my cure heads. If I still have bone, then I put the one millimeter drill stop and drill straight down. And again, if I'm at the sinus membrane, I'm done. If not, no, okay, I keep going. 1.5 millimeter drill stop, go down, okay, and so on until I'm in. And you can see here, I'm in on the left-hand side. On the top part of it, the bottom part, no, the bottom part was thicker. The top part, I'm in. All right. So then now I know the thickness of the wall there, and then I use that burr and then just slide it around 
and there's no way I can go too deep. And you see on the right-hand side, I've made it into an almond-shaped window using that same burr, okay? I take the PRP gel, cut it, put it in that box, and you see on the left-hand side, it's gonna compress it into membranes. I take the bone, hide it with the PRP liquid. After several minutes, you can see the gel turn into membranes. You see that in your lower right-hand portion of the screen. And now I'll elevate the sinus membrane off the sinus floor, pack the bone in there. Okay, here we packed in the bone. All right, and then put the membrane on top of it. Okay, and suture the membrane on top. Mm -hmm. What we started is, you know, if I want to learn tennis, then I need to be on a tennis court, not look at slides about tennis. I mean, I can learn, but I'm limited how much I can learn just looking at slides. If I want to learn bicycling, I need to get on a bicycle bicycle and um, is not just have slides on it. And I can get a stationary bicycle inside that's better than slides, but I still need to get an actual bicycle. Okay. And so what happens is if we're just taking lecture programs, what well, that's like lectures on tennis or on bicycling. If we is do model workshop, pig jar, cadaver, or plastic models, it's like being on a stationary bicycle. The best way is to be trained on patient after patient after patient after patient under direct supervision of the professor. And so we started doing that 15, 20 years ago. As with my residents, they do multiple procedures over and over and over under my supervision. It's on patients is in a variety of cases. And after that, it's easy to replicate in their practice. Is, and we open that type of concept up for non-residents, people that are not doing full year programs, to come in, spend three days, four days, and do, for example, 15, 20 lateral wall sinus lifts under my supervision, case after case after case after case after case. And you do five, six of these per day for day after day after day. Is it becomes something that becomes just as automatic as back in your practice, you're able to incorporate it. And so we offer that type of thing is with live patients for lateral wall sinus lifts, is uh, for the query technique, the bone plates, for the Ramus block harvest and such, for the all on four concept, where you do the all on four procedures, for of course, routine implant placements, uh, for soft tissue management, uh, is going through small openings and elevating the sinus is, um, and such. And so all of these types of things, uh, I, I will do them under my supervision and with a high faculty to student ratio would be me and I'm training two people, okay? Not 200 people in a live patient setting, is one faculty for every two maybe, is two chairs of uh, doctors. Mm -hmm. I say, what's the difference between PRP gel and PRP plug? Uh, PRP gel, you get a large gel. You take that large gel, and inside that little PRP box, there's a place that makes membranes, and there's another little circle. Okay, You take that large PRP gel, and you put in that circle, and it compresses it down to one-fourth the size. Okay, So now, it can be put into a socket, but it's four times as dense as the gel. And so if I'm going to put it in this crustal sinus, I wouldn't need it four times as, as dense. I want to have that gel get in there. If in a socket I'm going to put it, I'm going to put something alone, then I prefer the plug because more dense, more growth factors in the same volume than the gel would be, so I prefer a plug. But in a socket, I would typically prefer actually bone and then a membrane over it bone and a PRP membrane over it. So you go, when do I use a PRP plug? A lot of times I don't put bone for third molars. And so if I'm not putting bone for third molars, then a PRP plug is better than PRP gel because it takes gel that's this big and you would end up putting one fourth of it in there, compresses it down, and I'm able to put all of it in there, okay? So it increases is the volume where I'm gonna use my gel um, and I'm not putting in you know, you know, socket grafting. Okay, so that's what I would do for the PRP plug versus PRP gel. So you can see PRP plug doesn't have a lot of applications. And then to conclude here is the last couple of slides. I give them post-op instructions. As, um, I do a lot of books, and one of the books is actually on um, uh, actually sinus graphs. So it's 181 pages digital. All the six cases I showed you are in that book. Um, there's about another 25 or 30 cases in there step by step by step. Is everything I talked about is in that book. And um, if you will um, send Kate, who's organizing this, a uh, email, and then she can uh, send you a complimentary copy of that book. Okay, 
And, um, and, and Kate, I don't know if you're able to get this on the folks in the Facebook group, but uh, otherwise you can offer the same thing as there as well. Okay. And then complications can they happen? Of course. Uh, I see complications mainly when people are, um, is, uh, have bacteria in the area an undiagnosed peri or endopathology is, or a extracted tooth in the area. Uh, okay. And with the extracted tooth in the area is it, it had bacteria and the bacteria from the extracted tooth got into the area. And so is, I'd suggest be careful of those. Although theoretically there's hundreds of reasons of complications, but these are several common ones that I've clinically seen over the years. Okay. Is, uh, thank you, Dr. Ruth is, um, for saying thanks. Uh, here's my email for anyone that wants to reach out to me directly. It is Dr. Garg at implantseminars.com. It's very easy. And so you can jot that down. Is That's not my cell number, that 305-935-4991. That's actually the office number, but you can always call the office. That's the office number. I'm happy to give you my direct cell number, uh, but it's just not on the slide for some reason. Is, but email works well for me, Dr. Garg at implantseminars.com. And uh, that on the left-hand side is my main office in Miami, I've got four others. I have an office in Arizona, and then I have um, two offices in Dominican Republic, one in Santo Domingo and one in Santiago. The offices in Miami are mainly for private patient care, is um, the office in Arizona is primarily for training programs, to, to train you working on live patients. And the two offices in Dominican Republic, both in Santo Domingo and in Santiago, are primarily for training programs is uh, to train you and I've got full-time staff there that find patients and screen patients is for training programs. So you can come down and do um, is these procedures under my supervision is there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Garg. It has been quite an informative lecture for everyone. Moreover, you are an inspiration to all of us. So I think we are exceeded with uh, like time limits. So we can move on to the question and so. Okay. Is, um, yes. I try to answer by text some questions, but if there's some questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes, sir. Many of the questions have been asked and uh, many of our answered also. So we'll move on to the non-answered ones. Right. So we have Dr. Vivek with us. Uh, so is it better to mix the allograft with autograft in sinus membrane? Brain augmentation if we get some autogenous from tuberosity or would it be prefer only pure olographs I think I answered that on the on the chat but um, I'm happy to say it again is um, is and I prefer the terminology tissue bank bone because I think it's very understandable for everyone is uh, so tissue bank bone alone works very well for sinus but if you can get some bone from the tuberosity while you're there anyway of course it will upregulate it and so the best will be the tissue bank bone with some tuberosity bone with some PRP liquid. Um, but is that said, the tissue bank bone alone would be fine if you didn't put in the zytogenous bone. Definitely so. And uh, next we have Dr. Raj Bala. How about ground tooth structure dentine graft as a graft for the augmentation? Uh, is I don't know, and I don't know what country that question came from, but I can tell you in the US, my experience here, is that ground tooth structure is, it works fine, okay? But um, here it's very expensive and very cumbersome because I have to purchase a grinder, first of all. <clears throat> That's number one. And then you say, well, but then the teeth are free. Yes, but there's chemicals I need to then purchase to dissolve out the pulp and then rinse that off. And by the time I'm paying for the chemicals, it's the same cost as tissue bank bone. And, uh, and it's very labor intensive. You know, I'm a surgeon and to have patients open and take my time and, and patient time is makes no sense to me to take a tooth and I can't do teeth that have crowns on them. I can't grind them certainly. I can't grind teeth with composites in them or amalgams in them. I can't grind teeth with root canals and got a perch in them. So the only teeth I can realistically grind is virgin teeth. And I honestly don't extract a lot of virgin teeth and um, maybe third molars, but when I'm doing third molars, I'm not grafting anything. And so other than that, I don't really graft is uh, extract many virgin teeth. And if I were to extract a virgin teeth, it would probably be periodontally involved. And then at a late laborious process, take a hand piece and grind off all of as the soft tissue and then crush it and then soak in chemicals. And then is, uh, is remove those chemicals 
you know, I'd rather open a bottle and be done with it. It's not worth my time. And the cost is no savings. So I've got a product that's not a better product. The cost is the same and takes more time is energy farming. So to me, it makes no sense clinically. It's a neat little product. It's a neat thing for people to talk about in symposiums. Here's a novel topic for me to lecture about. So you see it in symposiums all the time. But uh, clinically, I don't think anyone would do that uh, long term. So saving time is the key, right? So next we have uh, Edgar. Uh, what is your opinion about other systems such as the DASC system? Oh, they were great. I showed you the final system was uh, the burr, okay? Is, um, and using a burr like that absolutely works is uh, there. Now, is the, the system I showed you is like the DASC, but has a drill stop on it. And so you can do it with a drill stop. You can do it without a drill stop, I feel, just like we do around burr. And any of those is work. Okay, absolutely. Okay. So we have Dr. Ishwarya. Uh, so sinus window wall that we removed can be used as for bone augmentation procedure, horizontal and vertical defects in other areas? You could, but is, uh, rarely is that such a large piece. And so as you can see from the cases that I showed, the piece that comes off is so small. Um, if you really wanna take a piece, there's two good options is take a piece from the ramus area and um, use that and then thin that out. And, uh, and tissue bank, you know, the osteolite biomedical, the particulate bone that I use, they make bone plates and large bone plates and you can bend those and, and, and use those. So that'd be much easier than trying to use that piece from the sinus because of size. Definitely. Okay, so moving on to the next question, we have uh, Dr. Ruth. How many cc's typically do you need for a sinus lift? Well, is, and I assume the question is about a fully edentulous uh, patient because fully edentulous patient, bilaterally edentulous uh, area and has pneumonization is probably going to be about three cc's per side. But a partially edentulous patient that's missing two teeth might just be one, one and a half cc's. A single tooth sinus lift, a crustal approach might be a half a cc. And so um, it's kind of very obviously on the number of teeth but I'm assuming she's asking fully dentures and that's going to be about the three cc's. Mm. Okay, moving on to the next one. Dr. Ardir, uh, which solution do you use to preserve the bone from the patient? Uh, saline, so the bone you've harvested as you soak it in saline. If you have the liquid PRP, you could soak it in that. Um, mm. If you soak it in the liquid PRP, and you had to use an anticoagulant, what happens when you put the bone particles in, the anticoagulant binds up the calcium, but from the bone shaving, it gets the calcium, and it gets the thrombin, it will clot up. Okay. 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 So we have Dr. Ahmed. If you're placing implants, will you first place implants or pack the bone? Yeah, this question well, is with me also. Yeah, I saw that. You need to put in about one third of the bone, so it's from a medial aspect. Okay then put the implants and then put the remaining two thirds of the bone. Because you put okay. all the bone first and then push the implants, the extra volume may tear the sinus membrane. Okay. If you put the implants first, then you have to try to pack the bone behind the implant, medial to it. Hmm. So one third bone, implants, the remaining two thirds of the bone. Okay. Hmm. So uh, next we have Dr. Vivek. Uh, what's your take on using slow resorbing xenografts in direct sinus lifts instead of allografts? I think I'd answer that in the chat, but it makes no sense. You know, if you take a, um, a material that's not going to resorb for, let's say, five years, and that's what these, you know, these dead cow bone materials do, they don't resorb for five years. So that means where I have a tightness bone, it gets replaced with the patient's own bone. Where I have tissue bank bone, it gets replaced by the patient's own bone. And so now my implant is surrounded by host bone. But when I have dead bone particles for five years, my implant is surrounded by dead bone particles. That makes no biologic sense at all to be surrounded by dead bone particles. That is promoted by the companies, the commercial entities that are selling these products. Because the problem is, is there's no profit in selling autogenous bone because no company can make profit on autogenous bone. Definitely. No company will ever promote it. And then sometimes what happens, speakers are sponsored by companies. So yeah. they may be a doctor title, but their payment for their hotel and their first class airline ticket and their limousine ride and their nice bottle of wine is coming from the company. Definitely. 
And no company is going to sponsor a speaker to talk about autogenous bone because there's no profit they can get. So that they promote the speakers to promote these commercial products and the speakers end up promoting. So the push for these long-term things comes from the commercial entities and the speakers that work for those commercial entities. But bone mm -hmm. biologists would never use that. His clinicians should never use that. Clinicians should look out for their patients, not for these companies. And that would okay. be tissue bank bone or autogenous bone. Sure. So next question we have Dr. Heyman. How you ensure that graft has reached by this technique till the palatal wall of the region or the base of the sinus? Yeah. With any of these things that are in essence packing things in blindly, you can never be sure is uh, while you're doing it. No one's going to stop and take sequential CT scans as you Definitely. do the procedure. Definitely. Okay. I mean, theoretically, if you say I am that OCD, I need to know precisely, then you take a step-by-step -step CT scans. Yep. But most of us are not going to do that. And so what you're going to do is you want to feel, okay? Because as you're packing with the condenser, I'm feeling that it's against the sinus wall. I'm feeling that it goes back posteriorly as far as I need to. I'm feeling that I hit the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus. I'm feeling that I'm hitting the medial wall of it, okay? So it's by feel. But is I'm always going to try to overgraft because I know I may not be able to feel accurately. So I'm going to try to overgraft so I have more than I need. And out of the excess, the body's going to resorb just like it does the sinus renumatize it around the roots of teeth. It'll renumatize the excess bone there around the roots of the implant. Hmm. Okay. Uh, then we have another question by Dr. Jigna. Can xenograft and autograft, uh, just a second, move on to another question uh, Doctor by, by Dr. Edgar. In an, in an complete edentulous maxillary arch, what is your advice by lateral sinus graft or angle tinted implants to restore the arch, assuming that there is adequate bone anterior to the pneumatized sinuses? Sure. Is, you've got to think in that case, and I do both of them. And in fact, my most recent textbook, you saw the textbooks here on you know sinus lifts and bone grafting and such. And my most recent textbook is titled Full Arch Implant Rehabilitation is FAIR. And that's our modified version of the sort of all on four technique that's been proposed for, for decades. And I do both of them and I teach both of them and I believe in both of them, but the end result is different for the two. You know, okay. is the end result for is bone grafts and implants ends up with eight or 10 or 12 porcelain crowns, maybe individual even, okay? That can be flossed and then have beautiful emergence profile of the soft tissues, okay? And you may have some of the presenters present those types of cases here. Okay, that wasn't what I was tasked with, but when I am, I show those types of cases. The end result of an all in four prosthesis is a one piece horseshoe, and the emergence profile is made out of zirconia, pink zirconia or pink Emacs. Okay, okay. there is no emergence profile. Okay, Definitely. there's no flossing. Okay, there's not even any brushing. Forget about Definitely. flossing, you can't even brush Definitely. it. Okay? Definitely. So, what happens is there's a certain category of patients who want the best. Okay, me, you, okay? We have a high dental IQ and we have the resources financially. We would want the best for ourselves and we want the best for our moms and dads. And we would elect to go for bone grafts and six, eight, 10 implants and crowns and maybe some bridges, okay? And there's a subset that say, look, I need quick, I need fast, I need inexpensive. You know, the truck driver and nothing against truck drivers, but he's in different income class and different time class. He has to get back to work and drive his truck cross country. You know what, all in four is what yeah. I'm suggesting to him, okay? Yep. So it's a different uh, is category. Okay, so we have a uh, next question by Dr. Krishna. How much blood do you collect from patient to prepare this type of PRF, um, uh, PRF type of membrane? Well, is um, if you take the test tubes and the test tubes are about 10 mLs. And so normally you need is an even number so they counterbalance each other, mm -hmm. okay? So for small sinuses, you can get two test tubes, 20 mLs. And normal blood draw when you donate blood is about four or 500 mLs, okay? So if you're taking 20, that's less than 5% of what you would give in a normal blood donation, all right? If you say, yes. well, I have a sort of a moderate or large sinus, then you take four test tubes, okay? So 40 mLs. Mm. Okay. So one of the questions is there from our association, Guma itself, that, uh, our younger colleagues and are very 
inspired by and want to know how to become a leader and do so much for selfless for dentistry. Um, yeah, I think is. Uh, I mean, I think in India there's no shortage of leaders. Lots of leaders is. Um, it sounds like that's where the question is coming from. Yeah, but, um, exactly. You know, it, I think in anything, when people say leaders, they want is it can be any category. You know, you can mm -hmm. say, well, I want to be a leading clinician and good for my patients. Or I want to be a leading speaker or leading author or a leading is family man or leading husband or, you know, whatever category. And um, is, you know, in any category, it means you have to have a passion for that, whatever you want to be a leader in. Definitely. And so a passion for that is a dedication for that, hard work for that. And um, is... And then I think the most important thing really is early on is to get uh, is good mentors. You know, I was sort of blessed that uh, I did my residency at University of Miami. It's considered one of the top tier is uh, residency programs in, in the US, probably the number one program in the country. Okay. And, um, and the mentors, the people that were my attendings were Dr. Robert Marks, as I trained under him. Is, um, and then Dr. Stu Klein, who is, uh, is renowned for head and neck trauma. And these are the guys that were, were my attendings at the time. And I got a chance to work with them and train under them and learn from them and, uh, and, and, and try my best to emulate them. And I think that's been the difference. Had I been at a different institution and met different people, okay, it would have been completely different. Um, so it's not easy to meet them as, as good mentors. But I think really the dedicated mentors is try to make themselves available. You know, I think it's a fallacy to say that uh, the top mentors are arrogant or stuck up or too busy. I think just the opposite is I think the really top mentors actually is make the time and want to see folks grow and want to encourage people and want to develop people. You know, I was doing a different webinar the other day and they asked me that, um, could I come and do full day programs on PRP and training programs in the country in India? And I said, I'm happy to, but it's a long ways from me. You know, it's about a 20 hour flight for me from Miami. Um, but I said, you know what I would be happy to do? I would be happy to take, you know, six or eight young folks that are young and ambitious and hungry and this is their passion and let me train them by webinar like this and i'm happy to do it. no cost hour after hour after hour and over and over and answer the questions for them and let them become the trainers of the future for prp all over india and now you can have six trainers okay and doing that so the person who asked this question is the resources are here you know is these offers are here i find the limitations not the mentors saying I'm not available or I'm not going to do it. The mentors are, I find folks limit themselves. They go, oh, he didn't really mean it. I'm going to disturb him. I'm going to bother him. I don't want to. They limit themselves. Okay. So that would be the other piece of advice is don't limit yourself. Is when someone makes an offer, take it. Someone opens the door, step through it. Okay. Otherwise the door Definitely. will close. Yeah. Definitely. You need to find those doors and enter into them. You're quite, uh, you know, insp inspirational for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, one, one or two questions more by Dr. Prashant. Can we go intraoral welding technique and immediately load with temporary teeth and lateral windows cases? Yes, of course. No, okay. I showed immediate, um, is, I didn't show immediate loader, but I showed immediate implant placement. Um, but again, it's not my topic, but when I do my, you know, all on four type of lecture, my fair is we show immediate loaded and you say, instead of doing immediate loaded all acrylic, I would like intro welding and then acrylic around it to strengthen that process. Absolutely. Fantastic procedure. Hmm. Okay. So we have one more question by Shah Jaz. Uh, is there any serious problem if there is sinus perforation and how to manage? Have you encountered this situation? Amazing. Yes, of course. Of course I've encountered it. Is uh, anyone who's honest will tell you they've encountered it. If they tell you they haven't encountered it, either they're not honest, okay, they're just lying, or they haven't done enough science, sinuses, okay? <laughs> and um, is uh, let me go over it quickly because it seems like um, we have sort of limit on time, is I categorize them into three categories, zero to three millimeters, three to 15 millimeters, above 15 millimeters. Mm. Zero to three millimeters is going to heal up within a week. I put a PRP membrane there, okay? That's it, done. It heals on the other side with the growth factors in three to 15 millimeters might take a month to heal. And the PRP membrane is only there for two weeks. So then I use one of the commercial collagen membranes, which in the US is about $100. That's my $100 penalty for tearing the membrane, <laughs> okay? So I use a commercial collagen membrane in there. Okay. And if it's over 15 millimeters, then I need to consider 
is aborting the procedure, coming back and letting the sinus membrane be formed. Definitely. Okay. okay, moving on to the next question we have by Dr. Alpesh. Uh, sir, what is your view on packing a lifted sinus area with PRF alone or, or PRF with minimum quantity of large particles of allograft? Yeah, it works very well. And I don't think I showed in today's presentation, but um, is we published an article about 10 years ago looking at one side with bone, one side with PRP gel alone. And they both work the same. Okay. And I do PRP gel alone in crustal sinus lift cases. Single tooth crustal sinus lift cases, I put PRP gel alone. And what holds up the sinus membrane is the implant. And so as a breathing, Okay, membrane that pressure, move. it membrane moves, but what holds it up is the tip of the implant. Lateral wall, because most often the implants aren't placed simultaneously. If you put PRP gel alone, it's going to be gone too soon before the bone forms. Okay, so there you've got to have bone in there. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, we have one question from Dr. Samuel. Please describe your process for dealing with uh, pre op science pathology prior to graft. Oh, there's a lot. I mean, that's a whole is big topic okay okay but the, yeah is uh, is the quick answers would be is any pathology that's there i deal with okay i'm trained and i feel comfortable and if it's a, a cyst in there a polyp in there some pathology i go and take it out myself and um if you're not trained is um in it then you send it to someone and you deal with the pathology is you're not going to go into an area that has and there's so many different pathology when you say pathology is such a big encompassing term Okay, so we talk about pus, we talk about cyst, we talk about benign, we talk about malignancy, so many different things, but uh, it has to be dealt with. You can't go grafting into his, uh, sites with pathologies. Okay, uh, one last question if we have is by Dr. Edgar. How often injury of posterior superior alveolar artery could happen and how to avoid it? You know, it is, um, it's up 17 millimeters from the ridge. Now that's an approximation, it depends how much the ridge is resorbed, but the window shouldn't be that high. And so you shouldn't be impinging on that. It's the places and the size of the window you make. And if you did, you take an electrocautery and you zap it. Okay. So I think we are exceeding with a bit of time limit. So Excellent. I would request every, like, it has been quite a mind blowing lecture and loads of questions are dead for you, but I think, we are having limited time, so I would request all the participants to put all the questions in the comment section, and definitely Dr. Oh, yeah. will be there okay. to the answer comment them section, all. I'll try to type in the answers there for you, okay? Definitely, so doctor is always there with you, all the participants. So with this, I think we'll uh, move on to the end of the session, and um, I would uh, inform all the participants for any sort of participation or C certificates, uh, must log into www gomha.org. So, uh, sir, would you like to add some few words at the end of the session? No, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sir. So with this, we'll move on to the end of the session. And uh, we are having loads of other interesting sessions lined up. So stay, stay tuned with this.
सर प्लीज हम वहां पर भी एक शिशु नहीं आना चाहिए आपने बंद 